Good morning. Please stand with me. Take your hymnals. Turn to hymn number 256. We're going to sing all four stanzas of What a Wonderful Savior, 256. Good to have you here today. Let's go together to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I pray your blessing upon the life of our church and not just ours, but of all your churches around the globe, that we would love you and, Father, that part of the expression of that love would be to take very seriously the study and understanding of your word, that we would have the power of your spirit to lead us into the truth of your words to us. And we pray for that help this day. Then, Father, we ask that you would bend our wills and grow our grace, that we might be strong in belief and practice of that word. So we ask for your help this day. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Last Sunday morning, the choir opening song was Hail the Day That Christ Arose. We're going to sing that as a congregation this morning. It should be the sheet of paper you have in your pew beside you. We're going to sing all three stances of that. Hail the Day That Christ Arose. Hail the day that Christ arose through the sky. Oh. 
Good singing. Please turn now back in your hymnals to 666. And I can't read the title of this song without asking you guys to stand, even though it's a little bit out of order. So let's stand and sing, Arise, My Soul, Arise. 666. seated.
you take your hymnals and stand with me and turn to hymn 392, we'll sing all four verses of Rock of Ages, hymn 392. Rock of Ages, after me, let me hide myself in thee. Our instrumental number this morning is num both uh, pages 45 and 46 in your songbook. 45 and 46. Hebrews chapter number 7 this morning, please. <clears throat> Hebrews.
Hebrews chapter number 7. And I do want to mention this before we stand and read the scripture because it just entered my mind and will go as quickly as it came in. But we're, we're praying for Michelle Hutton, uh, who is home recuperating after her fall. And I don't know if you saw the post on Facebook, but Michelle's mom, Sharon, and Dale and Sharon were member here for many years and moved a number of years ago down to southern Missouri. Fell and fractured some ribs and punctured a lung is in the hospital. And so if you would pray for her as well. And Sharon is, uh, I was just talking to her, <clears throat> to Faith about it. Sharon is getting ready to turn 80. So uh, just as you think of it, uh, <clears throat> keep them in your prayers. Let's go ahead and stand this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're going to begin in verse number 11 and read to the end of the chapter. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, for there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, that this with an oath by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much Jesus was made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. And let's pray. Our Father, I pray again for your help this morning, Lord, that you would, in the power of your Spirit, help me to teach your word clearly and help us to receive it faithfully. Father, help us not to discount what we read and what we hear as unimportant. It is critically important for our understanding of our own Christian experience. And so please, again, I pray that you'd help us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. troubled, heavy hearted, come to Jesus and find your place. If you're run down, empty
empty-handed. Come to Jesus and find your strength. He is hope for the hopeless, rest for the weary, help for the hurting. He is, he is mending the broken, bearing the burdens, all that you need. and find your way if you want freedom need forgiveness just come to Jesus and find his grace he is hope for the hopeless rest for the weary help for the hurting he is he is man the broken, bearing the burdens, all that you're needing, He is. Comforter, Counselor, Prince of Peace, author and maker of everything, defender, deliverer, King of Kings, He is, He is, helper and healer forevermore. Savior and shelter through every storm, my master, redeemer, and Lord of lords, he is, he is, child of heaven and son of man, provider, protector, the great I am, Alpha, Omega, beginning and end, he is, he is, hope for the hopeless, rest for the weary, Help for the hurting, he is, he is. Bending the broken, bearing the burdens, all that you're needing, he is. All that you're needing, he is. Well, Hebrews 7 is our passage this morning. I read, <clears throat> once again, what I read last Sunday morning. And last Sunday morning, our attention was primarily on verses 11 through 22. This morning, our attention will be primarily on 23 through 28. But as I work through this passage, on yet another message on Melchizedek, I began to think about Job. And of course, Job suffered tremendously with God's permission under the direct work of Satan. And part of Job's conversation began his, became part of his desire that he could have a conversation with the Lord about what was going on. That if he could just get to God and make his case and God would give an explanation of himself, that would be very helpful to him which finally happened in Job 38. Not as Job anticipated, not as Job expected, not even a word of sympathy, but a question. Who are you that talks and makes things darker when you don't know what you're talking about? And God began to interrogate Job along the lines of his knowledge. Do you know what I know? And finally, Job bends and cries uncle and declares, I surrender, I, I yield, I apologize. But God says, in effect, but I'm not done. <clears throat> but I'm not done yet. And two more chapters of questions. Can you, do you know what I know? Can you do what I do? Only then to receive 
the sympathy and the consolation and the payback. <clears throat> and my thinking was this, I'm working on these messages. We have been dealing now one way or another with Melchizedek since we've met him in chapter 5. And I think to myself, I get it. I get it. I need, a, I need a different priest. I get it. And as if the Lord says, but I'm not finished yet. <clears throat> but I'm not finished yet. I want to keep talking about this issue until I have deal with, dealt with it thoroughly. And the pastor is <clears throat> nearing the end of his discussion on the priesthood of Melchizedek. And the point that he is making in the passage that we are reading this morning, particularly verses 23 through 28, is that in Jesus Christ, the priesthood of Melchizedek is superior to the priesthood of the Levites. That is where I wish for us to begin this morning with exploring this question, right? It is the question that arises out of verse number 11. What is wrong with the Levitical system? If perfection, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, Hebrews 7, 11, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Something is wrong. Something is wrong. What's wrong with the Levitical system? Verse number 11 helps us to understand. It does not produce perfection. That's the way the pastor speaks. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood. Now we're going to return to that at the very end. But if perfection were by the Levitical priesthood. And the idea there is of being the finished product, of being the consummation, of being the purpose of things. And then in verse number 19, we read this sentence, for the law made nothing perfect. The law didn't make anything complete. Well, why is that? Right? What's wrong with the law? Well, it didn't make anything perfect. That's what's wrong with it. It made nobody perfect. Now, let's remember, folks, Hebrews 6.1, perfection is the goal. Perfection is the goal. And we ask, well, can the law help? Well, the law doesn't make anybody perfect. The law just didn't make anybody perfect. Well, why is that? Why didn't the law make anybody perfect? Let's ask the question, folks. Does that mean there's something wrong with the law itself? Is there something wrong with the law itself? Paul doesn't think so. Romans chapter 7, verse number 12, the law is holy and the commandment holy, just, and good. So Paul doesn't think there's anything wrong with the law. Let's think about this. Is there something wrong with the law? Is that what the pastor in Hebrews 7 is arguing? Now, I've got to tell you, folks, this, was, this would be Ken Larchin's estimation but in a fair amount of churches in 21st century, Bible-believing Baptist churches, conservative evangelical churches, many church members sit in the pew, and if you could really look at the way they think, they would say, you know what, there is something wrong with the law. And we know this because we seem to have this terrible obsession about being legalists, as if there's something wrong with the law. There is nothing wrong with the law itself. That is not what the pastor is condemning. The law is just. It is righteous. Thou shalt not kill is a righteous command. Honor thy father and thy mother. That is a righteous command. Thou shalt not steal. That is a righteous command. 
Love thy neighbor as thyself. That is a righteous command. The law is just. The law is holy. If you never murdered, there would, there would be no sin of murder. If you never bore false witness, there would be no sin of lying. The law is holy. Nobody ever followed the law and ended up sinning. The law is good. The law is good. It is just, it is just good in its character. It is just good. It is like a beautiful thing to behold. It is like a beautiful object of art, a great painting, a beautiful building. It is good. The law reflects God's own nature and God's own desires. The law is a wonderful thing. There's nothing wrong with the law. The problem, folks... <clears throat> Well, not only is there nothing wrong with the law, let me continue on in my outline. There's nothing wrong with the system. We notice, folks, we'll notice it again and again, that the pastor doesn't come to the, Hebrew, to the book of Hebrews, to this New Testament system, and go, you know what? You know what the problem with the law is? The problem with the law is that it had a priest. And man, we're New Covenant people. We don't need priests. Priests are outmoded and outdated. Priests are obsolete. There's nothing wrong with the system. Is there something wrong with killing the innocent on behalf of the guilty? Maybe that's the problem. That's not the problem. The prob I mean, not the problem, but killing animals... Killing innocent animals on behalf of guilty people doesn't accomplish anything. But if you kill an innocent person on behalf of guilty people, that accomplishes everything. It's not the system. It's not the system. It is obvious from the text of Hebrews that we need a priest, and we will need a priest forever. We will need a priest forever. But I do think, folks, if I can put it this way, and we're going to try and develop this a little bit more as we move on down the road in this con concept, we, we, we got to recognize two things, right? In all of our conversations about the law and the Levitical system and the priesthood of Melchizedek, right? we have the law in the sense of its content. The law is good. The law is holy. The law is just. And then with reference to Moses and the Levitical system, folks, right? We have the application of that law. How do we, right? Here's the difference. And we're just, we're going to get into this and we're going to spend some time on it. Here's the difference. Here's this beautiful law that is to us as sinful human beings completely and totally external. It is completely external. It is cut into stones. It is chiseled into stones, and there it is. And it exists completely on the periphery, on the outside of our lives. But inside, folks, on the inside, I am terribly at odds with that law. I don't live to that law. And so for all of its beauty and all of its holiness and all of its goodness, it is something external and unattainable to me. Try as I might. And since I cannot live it to its full demand, it does nothing other than condemn me. 2 Corinthians 3, Paul calls it the ministration of death. The ministry of death. Now, that's the law of Moses. That's the Old Covenant. What is the New Covenant? Here's where, again, my opinion, so much in New Testament Christianity has gone to pieces. What is the New Covenant? Not a change in the law, but a change in the location. 
What is the new covenant? I will write my laws in their heart. Not external on a stone, but internal in a heart. Now, many of those practices therefore go away because they were external practices designed to paint a, an external picture that is no longer painted. But the law, right, it's, it's where the law, it's how the law is applied. It is the practice of the law, the location of the law from external to internal that is the great change in the covenants, folks. The system of Moses was entirely external. We begin with a law cut into a stone. That's deliberate. Cut into a rock. Dead. Powerless. Demanding. Rigid. Unyielding. Unbending. Do it and live. Don't do it and die. The ministration of death. And the pastor now is going to turn his attention to focus on two reasons, his two reasons, why the law could not bring you to perfection and why the law never made anything perfect. And his reasons, folks, are not vested in any way in the quality of the law. Right? Not like, so here's what God did for you. God lowered the expectation. That's not it at all. That is not it at all. In verse number 23, right? Let's go, let's look at the text, right? Here, here are the two, here are the two flaws. The law made nothing perfect. The law never, it could not make anything perfect. It never did make anything perfect. Verse number 23, they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. What's flaw number one in the Levitical system? The priests died. Priests died. Verse number 27, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself, they sinned. And in fact, folks, you could put it this way, they died because they sinned. They died for the same reason you and I are going to die. Over the course of Jewish history, some priests were stellar. You don't need to turn to it. Let me just read to you. Ezekiel 44, 15. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. So here's God fast-forwarding centuries, and he's talking about the sons of Zadok, what faithful priests they were. So what a blessing it was, folks, to be alive as a Jew in the day when Zadok was the priest. What a faithful man. What a faithful servant. What an able ministry he brought. But what if you were an unfortunate guy who lived during the times when Eli was the high priest? Now, the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand, and he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servants came and said to the men that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have fl sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man send unto him, let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth. Then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now. If not, I will take it by force. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. And then a few verses later, now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Supposing that was the priesthood you lived under. Boy, if Zadok and his children were priests, you would bring your offering to the tabernacle or the temple gladly and offer it up to the Lord knowing that a good and godly man was going to make a sacrifice. But what if it was Eli? What if you had to bring your offering to the Lord in the presence of those kind of slugs? 
What if you had to say to your wife and daughters, I know you want to go to the temple, but you're not safe around the priest when you go to the temple. So these are the two problems that the minister focuses on in the book of Hebrews. That the priests die and the priests are sinful, but his emphasis is really how Jesus resolves that problem. Because remember, we're talking about the priesthood of Melchizedek. An everlasting priesthood based upon the oath of the Lord. Remember last week it is the verse the first eleven or the first fourteen verses, folks, are an exposition, or the first ten verses or first no, first twenty two verses are an exposition of Psalm one hundred and ten verse four. The Lord has sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So in verses 26 and 27, the pastor points out to us that Jesus is a sinless priest. Jesus is a sinless priest. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sin and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. The word becoming there, he's the one becoming. It means both that it is appropriate and it stands out. It is appropriate and conspicuous. Jesus is not like those other priests. He is holy. He is untainted with sin. He has no sin, never had sin, doesn't like sin, has no appetite for sin. He is harmless which really refers in this place not that he won't hurt you, but that he is free from the guilt that is associated with sin. The only other place in the Bible it's used is Romans 16, 18, where it's translated simple. When it comes to sin, folks, Jesus is really rather simple. He doesn't have any. He's not tainted by it in any way, shape, or form. It holds absolutely no to appeal to him. If you pulled Jesus off into a corner and tried to tell him a dirty joke, he wouldn't find it funny. If you recommended to Jesus that you boost the church offerings by robbing a bank, he wouldn't find it a good idea. He is holy. He is harmless. He is undefiled. He is untainted by anything that is tainted by sin. He is completely spotless. He is as clean and as pure as is possible for any to be. And he is separate from sinners. Now, he came to earth and he rubbed shoulders with sinners, folks. But here's the miracle. He never became like them. We're, we're just going to become like who we hang around with. We're going to become like what we hang around with. We are like, we are like little sponges. We absorb. Jesus is not like that. He's impervious. He can come to earth. He can eat a meal with sinners. He can put his hands on those sinners. He can weep over the impact of their sinfulness. He can grieve over the sorrow that sin brings them. But he has no connection to their sinfulness. He is completely undefiled. And he is completely out of reach of sin. He is made higher than the heavens. I mean, there's just nothing sinful about him. There is no taint. There's no touch. There's no corruption. And what this means then is that he does not need to offer a sacrifice for his own sins first. Right? Under the system of Aaron, every priest began here by atoning for his own sins. In other words, so let's, let's, I mean, let's, I mean, New Testament connections are kind of sketchy at best, but and let's, let's imagine if the very first thing that happened in a church service at Westwood Heights Baptist Church, the very first thing, you come to church, what's the first thing that we're going to do? The first thing that we're going to do is Pastor Largen is going to come down the aisle and get on the altar and confess his sins to the Lord and ask forgiveness. Then he's going to come up and preach to you about your sins. That was the Levitical system. 
That was the Levitical system. Jesus is better. He doesn't have any sin. He's not tainted with sin. He's so far away from sin, you can't even really describe how far away from sin he is. Totally uncorrupted by sin. Finds it completely unappealing. And therefore, he doesn't need to offer for his own sins, but instead is able to offer himself. And so powerful is his perfection, if you look at verse number 27, for this he did once, the Greek language there, I'm assuming that you know this, is incredibly emphatic, folks, that he did it only one time. This is one of the issues that we have, folks, with any religious system in the name of Christ that recreates his crucifixion as part of its worship. He did it once and it was enough. He just did it once and it was all that is needed. Or if you go back, folks, and I think it's Numbers chapter 28 or maybe Numbers chapter 29, you kind of have this little chronicled explanation of what the sacrificial lifestyle of the Jewish people was. Sacrifices in the day, sacrifices in the evening, sacrifices in the month, sacrifices in the week, sacrifices in the year, never-ending stream of death and blood for sin. Jesus One time. One time. Adequate for all who will ever believe. Adequate for all regardless of their guilt. So part of the problem with the practice of the Levitical system is that the priests themselves were sinners. And Jesus is superior to that because he is not a sinner. So problem number one, sinful priests... Solution number one, Jesus is not sinful. Problem number two, priests die. But Jesus is an eternal priest, verses 23, 24, and 25. They truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Right? There were lots of priests. There were lots of priests. And you kind of needed lots of priests because they tended to die. But because Jesus doesn't die, his priesthood doesn't change. He's never going to be replaced. Now again, folks, right? there's nothing wrong with the basic system, the concept that we need a priest. The problem in the Old Testament was priests kept dying on us. They kept dying because they were sinful in their own right. What this means, this is where the pastor goes with this, right? This man, verse 24, because he continueth ever, because he has eternal life and doesn't die, doesn't change his priesthood, and therefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. This is how he does it. And what the word uttermost means, folks, and again, I'm going to come back and try and tie this all together at the end this morning. But can I translate it as we read it? Wherefore, he is able to save them to perfection. To perfection. That's the goal. God can't be satisfied with anything less. He is able to save them to perfection. If perfection were by the Levitical system, we'd just keep on being Jews. But the law made nothing perfect. It just simply ushered in a better hope. And here comes Jesus without sin. So am I, I'm able to be your sin offering and your high priest. And here comes Jesus. I live forever. I I don't need to be replaced. And therefore, I am able to save you to perfection. Because I am ever living to make intercession for you. This is exactly, by the way, what Paul argued in Romans 8.34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, ye rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And I don't think that we should 
think of, I don't think we should misrepresent what is being argued here. It is not like God the Father has some residual hostility toward us. That if the, that if the Son doesn't keep placating the Father, no, that was settled with the sacrifice. Right? One sacrifice placated the wrath of God forever. I mean, just think of how hard it is to live the Christian life. We still need the ministry of a priest, one who is interceding for us. As Jesus said to Peter, 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 Satan hath desired to have thee, that he may sift thee as wheat, but I have prayed for thee. I have prayed for thee. This is what we need. <clears throat> So they're the two problems, folks. They're the two problems. They're just that simple. Right? Why? The system doesn't make anybody perfect. Is the law flawed? No, the law is not flawed. Is the basic structure of the system flawed? The needing of a priest and the needing of an offering? No. But the law is completely external and its demands are imposed from the outside in and therefore they're never lived from the inside out. And the emblems are its failure are the death of the priests because of the sinfulness of the priests. But Jesus, the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, doesn't sin and doesn't die. Problem solved. <clears throat> Beginning in verse number 28, folks. <clears throat> For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. But the word of the oath, which is since the law, maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Verse number 28 functions really, truly, genuinely as a summary statement, as an explanation of what has been going on. The law made weak men priests. That's verse 28. The law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. Remember Aaron, the first high priest? Remember him, the very first high priest. And Moses goes off to the mountain to meet with God. And in a matter of minutes, there is a naked, drunken orgy going on down below. And when Aaron is confronted, how he let it happen, he said, it's, it's a mystery to me. I just threw this gold into the fire and out came this golden calf. Completely, un I just have no explanation. The law makes men who have infirmity priests. But the oath, Psalm 110 verse 4, which was since the law, after the law, maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. The son is an eternal priest, not like Aaron, not from the tribe of Aaron, not under the authority that Aaron had, not at all. And there is one thread, folks, that is woven throughout this, and I've already made several references to it, but I just want to, cl when closing, I just want to take a couple of moments and take the big steps. Look back, if you would, at chapter 6 and verse number 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. We are to go on to perfection, the goal of Christianity. What that goal really means, and I'll try and prove it to you in just a moment, what the goal really is, folks, is complete and total likeness to Jesus Christ. Complete and total likeness to Jesus Christ. In chapter 7 and verse number 11, we are told that this perfection cannot come through the Levitical priesthood. The law is like Jesus Christ, but the law cannot make me like Jesus Christ. In chapter 7 and verse number 19, we are told that the law made nothing perfect. But in 725, you are told, we are told, that Jesus is able to save to the uttermost, which is literally every perfection. 
Perfection is the goal. Right? What do we say? What is the goal? Right? Charles Spurgeon said, if I could be anything that I wanted to be, I'd be without sin. Perfection is the goal. The law can't make me perfect. The law made no one perfect. But Jesus can give me every perfection. He will save to the uttermost. No imperfection will remain. He can do what the law cannot. And this is because, folks, verse number 28, he is eternally perfect. That's really what the word consecrated means. He is eternally perfect. And he ever lives to make intercession for me. Perfection is the goal. This is where we end up, folks. Look, it is, it is true that God wants to save people from hell. It is absolutely true. But it is not true that God wants to save everybody from hell so that they can go on and just be the best version of themselves. Here's what Paul told us in Romans 8.29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. This is the goal of salvation, folks. This is the perfection that we seek. This is the completion that we are in pursuit of. This is part of the responsibility of a local church every time we meet, Ephesians 4. To be teaching the congregation, to be pressing the congregation, to be pushing the congregation. What is the ambition? More like Christ, more like Christ. How will this be? Legalism, folks, is the attempt to make us like Christ by imposing external dimensions upon us. New Testament Christianity is the law of God written in our hearts. Let's pray this morning. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, may we be so very concerned <clears throat> not to let our salvation slip away from us, to lose sight of what your goal for our salvation is to be like yeah. Jesus. And may we understand, Lord, that the goodness of your law will be created in our hearts, nurtured by the nature of Christ in us, informed by the Scripture, empowered by your Spirit, never ever pressed down upon us in an external sense, as the law was pressed upon people with hearts of stone. Thank you that you are able to save us to every perfection because you are always perfect. Encourage us. Encourage us to this end, please. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, before we have our closing song, just one announcement this morning, a reminder um, about the youth activity um, <clears throat> and the change for this Friday at the 15th um, instead of uh, the scavenger hunt, which is going to be moved to the spring, uh, it will be WHBC movie night 6 to 9 here at uh, the church on the 15th. No cost to that. All right, let's go ahead and stand, please. We're going to have our closing song, of course, 6 o'clock tonight, the evening service, 5 o'clock for our practice. Thank you for being here today. We will see you tonight. Please take your hymnals and turn to hymn 15. We're going to sing the third stanza of Across the Lands. 15. With a shout you rose victorious, blessing victory from the grave, and ascended into heaven, wrapped is in your way. Cry of love rings out.
just 